So I'm calling my son. Je suis fier de ça. I'm proud of him. Je crois que c'est l'image de ce que doivent être les enfants de pasteur. I believe that the image of the pastor's son. Les politiciens ont leurs enfants qui font la politique. Yes. Politicians train their children. Les médecins veulent que leurs enfants fassent la médecine. Mm. Les professeurs veulent que leurs enfants soient professeurs. Et les pasteurs veulent que son enfant soit aussi prédicateur. On va dire, mais qu'est-ce qu'il veut dire C'est le même pour les types de preachers aussi. Well. Non, ce gars-là n'est pas dans un empire. Mais il est dans une famille. Yes. Il est dans une famille. Amen. Il a grandi autour de la parole de Dieu. Il grew up around the world cup. Salam. Salam. Viens le prouver. Vamos a ver. Uh, if you can sing with me for a second, uh, as I was standing there, the song came to my head. Um, holy, you are holy, King of kings, Lord of Lord, you are holy. Archbishop Margaret Bensley Dahosa. She is the wife of the late Archbishop Bensley Dahosa. She has a ministry that has over 8 million members. I remember one time we went to a church service. It was on a Thursday, 11 a.m. There was 18,000 people. 11 a.m. on a Thursday. I said, wow. That's when the Lord opened my eyes. So, when we got the chance to go back, you know, we're, we're, I was privileged, you know. You know sometimes you're just blessed because you are with someone who's blessed. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So I was just blessed because I'm the son of a consecrated bishop, so I got the chance to go and enter Mama Ilausa's house. Let me tell you, to enter that house is no joke. Even government officials can't enter that house. 
So I was blessed to enter there. Not only there was I blessed to enter, I was blessed to be on the table. So I'm on the table with some of the preachers you know. It was the first time in my life I was on the same table as Bishop David Oyedepo. You guys know about David Oyedepo? Yes. So I'm sitting on this table and I'm like, this is unbelievable. So in the midst of all these great dignitaries, in the midst of all these illustrious hosts that were there, you know, they were asking questions. And then I remember, I'm American. I can ask whatever I want. She would think, oh, here's the American kid. Son, ask the question. So there were bishops there, there were other archbishops there, that was there. As we're sitting on the table, I said, Mama, because everybody called her Mama. It's an eternal endearment. I said, Mama, I have a question for you. Um, actually, I have two questions. The first question was, how was it living with the men like Ben Salida Hosa? It must have been kind of hard. <laughs> everybody was talking. When I asked the question, everybody shut up. Because now everybody's looking. Mm, who would ask this question? So as it's asking the question, um, what was amazing is she started answering. She said, you know, son, living with a man like that takes a lot of faith. He wasn't an easy man to live with. And then I, re I realized that she was trying to be diplomatic with her, with her answer. Then I asked her the second question. I said, mama, me and dad in the ministry, you know, mom was there too. I said, we travel a lot. We go to many places. But man, preaching the gospel is expensive. Because I know how much we spend to go and preach the gospel. I said, if we preach the gospel in Europe, it's costly, mama. What can we do? Is it another way for us to avoid paying so much money? See, I was expecting her answer to be comforting. You know what she told me? The gospel has always been expensive. The gospel will always cost money. She said, the answer is signs and wonders. So let's read the scripture. Mark chapter 3. Go with me to Mark chapter 3. Should I just take another mic? Mark chapter 3, when you're there, say, I'm there. I'm there. When you're there, say, I'm there. I'm there. All right. We're going to read from, starting from the first verse all the way to verse 8. Mark chapter 3, starting from the first verse all the way to verse 8. It says, I'm going to read from the NIV version. In another time, Jesus went into the synagogue. A man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched out his hand and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. My favorite part, verse 7, it says, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to take to go to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Amen. Amen. One thing I love about this text is, especially verse 1, for those of you guys, uh, I usually do a Skype call with a lot of young people all over the world. Uh, we do at least one or two Skype calls every month. And I shared this message, and I only shared verse 1. Because really what's interesting in verse 1, it says, the first two words is another time, another time. It doesn't say the first time, it says another time. Another version said, Again, Jesus went into the synagogue, and the man with the shriveled hand was there. This already tells me that this was not the first time Jesus went there. Yes. Why is this important? Because when we see that there was a man with a shriveled hand, we see that this was the only time that the Pharisees decided to kill Jesus. 
I didn't say it. It says it here. In verse verse 6, it says, The Pharisees went out and flooded with the area how they might kill Jesus. Why didn't they kill him before? Ask, ask yourself, why didn't they plan to kill Jesus before this specific occasion? Because this time, Jesus disturbed what was the norm. Jesus finally became controversial. What we talked about the first day I talked about. Yes, yes. Why? Because Jesus came showing signs and wonders. Yes. Because the scriptures earlier, when you read, it says that Jesus would come to the temple and discuss with the makers of the laws about the word of God. Yes. See, in life, when you're only about theory, you can be controversial. Mm. It's the moment you decide to act upon what you believe. Amen. Amen. That you become controversial. See, it's good to believe the Bible, but if you don't put what the Bible actually asks you to do, it doesn't matter. Yes. See, today in church, I like to preach four hours. We sweat sometimes as pastors. We preach on healing, but we don't lay hands on the sick. <laughs> so how do you believe in healing and you don't put the action that Christ said, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover? Yeah. Amen. You believe in prosperity, but you run away from the principles of sowing and reaping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or you do half of the part. You do the sowing, but you don't do the watering. Ooh. Come on. See, I studied farming in school. I know, I'm black, and we black people farm too. So when I went to school, I was the only black guy in the whole class. Because most of the black people would, wanted to become doctors and business. So I did agriculture business management. And one of the things we, they teach in, in agriculture, you have to understand, every farmer does not stop by just putting the seed on the ground. What would happen if you just put the seeds on the ground and be like, see you in six months, it would die. You have to water the seed. Yes. You have to come back and water the seed. You have to take out the weeds. So you're sowing, you come to put the tithes and offering, and that's all you do. Oh, God bless me. How about you water what you put into the seed? See, the moment you start to apply what you believe, that's the moment you become controversial. See, in this specific text, and that's when I realized that mama was correct on her answer, that signs and wonders is what changed. She told me a story. Mama Idaosa and Ben Son Idaosa that we all love and respect, in 1968, was it 68 or 78? I think it was 1968, they first came to England in 1968, at that time, they came to England at this time. They had no money. They wanted to do a crusade in Trafalgar Square. Benson and Elsa, Nigerian, no money. It was first time outside of Nigeria. Goes over there to try to do an event in Trafalgar Square with no money. And then mom's, mama said, we were able to do it because they prayed for the wife of a millionaire that was healed of an incurable disease that God funded and gave them a million pounds. <laughs> and that's how they were able to do one of the largest crusades at the time in Trafalgar Square. Pastor Romeo, signs and wonders. See, here the scripture says, read with me verse 7. So after Jesus healed the man that was with a shriveled hand, it says in verse 7, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd, a large crowd followed him. Amen. In verse 8, it says, when they had heard, see, people don't care how long you preach. When they hear that people get healed here, they will come. People don't care how much you know of Latin and Greek and Hebrew. The moment they know that when they come, their life will never be the same, they will come. Amen. You want your church to be filled with signs and wonders. Amen. See, that told you the mindset. I'm telling you the application. See, we want authority. See, see, when you have power, even asking for offering, you change people's lives. Amen. Signs and wonders will bring the crowds that we need. Amen. See, one of the things that I've understood with other groups, other faith and religions, is that they understand the power of numbers. But it seems like in Christian areas, especially some of our brothers and sisters, we think it's, I gotta put this, we think it's honorable for us to expose others. 
oh, you know, I know this pastor over there, did you know? We think that makes us better because we're going around exposing people. The first time I met this Hindu, this guy who went to school together, was a Hindu. He said, in our faith, especially in our shoko, even if we find somebody who's dishonoring our faith, we're going to deal with him in private. We will never let know anybody else on our shoko that you do something wrong. Thank you. Paul was writing to the church and says, how dare you, you go to the unbelievers to judge your problems. We are a family as Christians, so if we have to deal with people, let's deal with it in the house. I know that if there's a problem in the Sony's house, you will never know. Why? It's not your business. For the people of the world to know that there's issue in the church, it's not their business. What is their business? To know Jesus. Yes. Amen. Signs and wonders. Amen. Signs and wonders. It says, when Jesus came, what did I love here? It says, when they heard of all he was doing, you know what's so specific? I looked in many different versions. And this part where it says, he was doing. It said he was doing. He acted. What the steps he took. It never said what he was saying. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? That there comes a part whenever we want to see the change in our churches, we need to move past just what we're saying. You guys want to actually bring a lot of people and reach to people outside the community? How about we put events where we actually go and physically reach out? I told you guys a story one time we did an event in Bolton where we were inviting a lot of young people to come for a, it was, um, how can I put this? It was like a celebration, evangelism day that we did, um, a festival, if I can call it. And we played music. There was a lot of kids in the area that used to take drugs and alcohol and would hang out on the street. I don't know if you guys have seen this, there's a lot of kids that just hang out on the street, yeah, yeah. they have nothing to do, yeah. it's the summer, you know, they hang out. So in the area where we were doing it, there was a lot of kids, they would smoke, you know, every day when we come, we do the training, we see those kids, you know, I try to connect with them, and usually when they hear my accent, oh, you're American? You're from New York? I'm like, you know, I use that as a tool to bring them in. Yeah. So the day we did the festival, a lot of them, we opened the door, music was playing, but a lot of them weren't coming in. What was crazy was, this was the church over here. There was this big hall and alley that would go back there. It was really dark. Many of them would go down there to smoke and have sex. And I mean many, not just one kid. Many would go, come back. Many would go, and after a while, this is in front of, this is in front of the main door. It's like that door right there. The main door of the church, they're passing to go have sex. I said, this is unbelievable. This is unacceptable. So guess what we did with that? That day, as the event is starting, all we decided to do is step there, stand there. Say, oh guys, did you guys know that there's a church over here, we're doing a free event here, there's music, there's free food, come in. Some of them will come like, oh, there's a church here? They've never known that there's a church there. Never. And they've been coming there for a long time. They've never known that that building was a church. That church was built in the 13th century. So this is not a new church. What is my point? And I'm about to be finished. My point is, let's not just be a church that makes noise. Let's live with signs and wonders. Because some of those kids, when they came in, and we preached, some of them were so touched by the Holy Spirit, they started puking. All the alcohol they drink in the building. It's to let you know as well, that the moment you want to live with signs and wonders, it might be messy. You know what I mean? Your, your church service might be messy. You might bring people here who don't know when to clap. They don't know how to do it. There's a lady that came to that meeting. She didn't know that, you know when I'm preaching like that, you guys are listening to me. Because you're used to this. This lady <laughs> that is speaking in front, she stands up for what she wants. She comes to that. She said, yeah, I have a testimony. In the middle of the message, it's not a testimony time. And she gives a testimony. She goes back to sit back. 